um, so what we did was uh, Becky helped me put together a PowerPoint presentation and um, most of the pictures are hers and um, she, she's, she's been an integral part of us getting the word out and um, if there's a, if there's a visual success to this, it's, it's on, it's on her account. So what I did is in the process is I tried to, instead of just showing you everything we have, we took pictures of the unusual or the rare, the more rare stuff. And, um, you know, you've probably all seen enough elliptical chucks for two lifetimes. They, they, most of them are all the same. Now, I did take pictures of a couple of them that are different, but you'll see as we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to sharing the screen, and I'm just going to go through the PowerPoint. If you do have a question, don't, don't hesitate to ask, and uh, it doesn't bother me to be interrupted at all. So let's see if I can successfully do this screen share. And... Yeah, that's that working. good. Yeah, that's good, David. That's working. Well, um, we're, but Bill, Bill, Bill named this the Plumier Foundation, and that's Bill Ruprecht. He's he's really the founder of this, and he named it the Plumier Foundation after Charles Plumier, of course. And most of you probably know who he was, um, a botanist to Louis the Fourteenth. He did most of his own woodcuts for the printing. And Louis XIV had his book on wood turning printed. He was, his father was a wood turner. His mentor had a turner in his chambers. He was a priest and his, his mentor was too. And his books on botany are, were, were at the time more popular than his books on turning or his book on turning. But uh, nonetheless, in, in the long run, I think his book, book on turning is more popular. Now, he, he wrote this book, and they published it in 1701. It was republished again in 1749. But the earliest piece of ornamental turning that they know of is in the Victoria and Albert Museum from, from 1539. And uh, you think about the, the gap in years between the two, about 150 years before anything was really published on this. And uh, Moxon had about seven pages that were almost useless, but Plumier's book had pictures of straight line engines and lead screws and on and on. And, and you can't overestimate the impact he had. He wrote it in both French and Latin so that it could be more broadly read. And uh, I believe uh, Fred, uh, Peter the Great had it translated into both Russian and Dutch. So it was a really important book. And especially given the idea that he wrote it in French and Latin, we know he really wanted to disseminate the information. And that is at the heart and soul of what Plumier is about. It's about disseminating the information on ornamental turning. And uh, there's a cabinet making side to what we do as well. So, uh, See if I can move the slide forward. Palace, Refuge, and Studio. Now, the, 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 those three words, when we, when we set out to make a mission statement, what I did is I went back through a lot of old emails between Bill and I and um, really tried to pull out the essence of what, what he was trying to accomplish. And... You know, a palace is, is a great house. And um, he put that together here. I mean, you get, we have about 3,500 square feet, ample space, very well lit. And uh, a while back, someone said, a palace has to have stained glass windows. And I walked in the room that morning and saw this picture in front of me and pulled out my cell phone and took a shot of it because we, we have stained glass windows or something like that at least. So <laughs> um, 
But it really is, it really is a magnificent place. From the, from the moment you walk in the door, you, you know you're in a different place. Refuge, it, it, it's, um, Bill was an apprentice cabinet maker when he was in college. And he, even though he didn't pursue cabinet making as a career, he, he figured out really quickly that craft is a really lonely and, and brutal place. Um, often work alone, you, you're, you're stuck with your thoughts and, and whatever it is in front of you. And often you don't have a very big network of people you can you lean on. And he wanted this to be a community. And Uh, looks like I've muted David. Now we're back again. I'm back. Yep. We're back. Yeah. So, so studio. We. This isn't a museum here. We actively make things. We are using the machines we have. Um, the objective is to see them used and to help other people that have them use them as well. If if we're not using the machines, we're not we're not meeting our objective. So anyway, uh, so what you see here on the left is, is a picture I took one morning when we walked in. And on the right is a picture I believe my wife took one day as my son was looking in the cabinet and um, grabbing a different piece of tooling so he could do one job or another. And that is my son, he's 27. And uh, he, he's, he's worked with me in the shop since he was about nine. And uh, a lot of the boxes you see on Facebook and Instagram and so forth, they're, they're his work. Uh, first machine we'll talk about is a John Bauer machine. Um, oh, I should spend a moment talking about how Bill got into this, too. He was an apprentice uh, cabinet maker in college, and he read the two articles in the Fine Woodworking magazine on ornamental turning. And uh, he was taken by the machines, just really taken by it. And um, some years later, probably about 10 years later, he, he purchased his first machine, which was uh, number 2195 that had been owned by Norman Tweedle put it in storage and this was the idea to uh, put him in storage and when he got to where he could or retired or whatever, he would uh, start this. So what I'm gonna do is just go down the line and, and the machines we have and talk about them and what's special about them. The uh, John Bauer machine is probably the, uh, the machine I appreciate the most as far as looks especially. It's just an absolutely beautiful piece of equipment made in the 1830s, and his work stands out. Uh, Holtz Apple would send him work to convert regular ornamental turning lathes to rose engines. He made some of his own, et cetera. But this, this really stands out. And the, the one thing we really just, you, you walk up to and you're taken with is this overhead. This overhead is just magnificent. The overall, it, it has a different look completely than the, uh, the Holtz apple. I mean, obviously they're both ornamental turning lathes, but his has a, a whole different feel to it. The overhead though, if you look at the contours, this is a square bar up through here. It's not a round bar, it's square. A lot of extra effort went into that. You look at the proportions, you look at the hook at the end, the way the weights hang, it's just it's just incredible. I have no idea what these two little holes are here, and what they're for. If anybody can tell me what those are for, I'd appreciate it, but I do not know. When you look at the, the lathe, it is, it is strikingly different than, than the Holtz apple. What's missing here, and we, we don't use this one yet because we've got to make some things for it. One is the uh, hand crank that goes in here. It mounts on these two sides. We'll have to make a pattern, have a casting made, etc. When you look at the oil cups, I mean, they're just ridiculously beautiful oil cups. 
and um, they're, they're just everywhere you look, they're details. Um, move on. Another picture of the oil cup. Um, you look at these knobs. He doesn't just use the rope neural, but he gets these contours. The contours are just absolutely magnificent. Here is the hole here is how he mounted his, his uh, straight line chuck and his um, elliptical chuck, and then it would press against the sides you could, so you could adjust it. So there's a little bit of wiggle room, and that allows you to actually move the chuck up and down. It's not like a Holt sapple. We, the the uh, only one of our Holt saffles that lines up is the one that we had to modify. Um, here's some more detailed pictures of it. And I mean, look at the knob back here. So, so a lot of his knobs have a concave back. Some of them have convex. Um, but you look at this and you see he finished the iron out to the degree he actually didn't need any paint. And that, that's just so impressive. So impressive. And um, these are the uh, square, square head screwdrivers and they're out of horn. And again, the, the detail just takes you. The drawer knobs are also made out of horn. Look at the little details up and around here. He, a lot of guys did that. He did it really well. These are the drilling frames that fit into the, uh, I shouldn't say drilling frames, they're um, the, the tool slides that fit into the top of the toolbox. Um, you could have the toolbox or you could put these in and they interchanged. And the drilling, uh, the eccentric head goes into the drilling frame, et cetera. But look at the contours on these. They're, they're actually contoured this way as well as this way. So the double contoured, a filing nightmare, an absolute filing nightmare. This is one of the cutting frames I pulled out because this universal cutting frame has a worm. It adjusts with the worm. I don't know what happened here. It was, that does not look original to me and I hope it wasn't, but, but the rest of this is just stunning, just stunning. And, and the useful idea, um, here, here is his um, elliptical chuck. And again, you're back to the same thing. Look at the contours in the, in the big nuts that cinch the thing down. These are flats on here. This is what goes through the headstock. He used square drives, square drives for his gib adjustments. So, um, None of that super thin screwdriver blade that always twists on you. Um, kind of like Evans here, he used the, the, the lock. Evans, so you'd seat it down the same way every time. Look at how he did the pallets on the back, the, the contours, just beautiful. This is, um, this one over here is a Holt sapple. Holt sapple on the right. And the bower on the left, and you you'll notice you know there's the cam design that Holt Saffle used. Here's the, the but uh, notice the size difference. This 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 lathe is very diminutive in comparison, and it's that's part of what makes it so beautiful. Then he had, then he had a second um, elliptical chuck with the lathe, and you look at this gigantic worm wheel he had on here, and you had worm wheel, and you had um, the, the uh, latch plate. So worm wheel and latch plate gave you the best of both worlds. You could micro adjust with the worm, you could, you could uh, move with the latch plate, or you could just uh, index with the, with the worm. But uh, this one was a little bit larger. Straight line shock. Um, this, is, this is the uh, pinion he had on here made much the same way, except the, the, the lines are straight. It made the same way that you would make a, a worm. Over here, you'll see the, uh, pin, the, the, the rack that goes with it. Notice how he mounted the ears, the detent. Again, the, all the contours on there, just excruciatingly hard to make. Here is the pin chuck, or if you prefer, the fluting chuck.
because it the Bauer is a proper Rose engine, by the way, the headstock rocks. And uh, there's a late rosette holder that needs to be um, modified to work. So the next lathe in line is uh, Holtz Apple number 2410. That was, it was made in 1892. It has a, a double shepherd's crook overhead. Now this section of the overhead is original. The pulleys themselves are not. I think the uh, caps on there are. But if you notice this, this, this piece here is not old. We actually made that. What, what we did, we wanted ball bearings so that we could turn our cutting frames faster and not wear out the original equipment because uh, they're, they're, as you know, they're on cone bearings. And cone bearings have a tendency to wear fast and they can't go fast. So, so you, you have a tendency to um, gall them and they'll, they'll burn the oil out and gall if you run them too fast. So we made this because we wanted to have a, the look of, of uh, the old overhead drive. We wanted to also be able to go to treadling. If someone wanted to do that, we wanted to be able to go to treadling in just a few minutes. And, but we wanted high speed. We, we mounted the motor from here. It just clamps on. So if you wanted to put that on an old one, you, this clamp would not do anything invasive. The worst possibly do is scratch the paint minimally. And then we have a 5,000 RPM DC drive motor with a, with a very small pulley on it to drive that. This is the uh, original Holt Sapful slow speed drive. Um, here's another picture of it over here. And um, that you, you use the, the gears from the, uh, the spiral attachment. Right here is your engage and disengage for your clutch. And uh, this is your, your uh, adjustment for belt tension. It is Ridiculous overkill in one, one aspect, but it is absolutely beautiful to watch running. Absolutely beautiful. There's another slow speed drive and that's here. And this is, this is um, works with a worm. This worm drives the worm wheel, drives the worm wheel. And then this of course drives this worm on the headstock. If you put the segment pins in, they come and hit this side or this side and kicks it out. So it was especially good for like dome chuck work and things of that nature. Uh, you can see here's the motor I use to drive this uh, slow speed drive in the back. It's a DC motor. I wanted a shunt wound motor so that it would uh, not look modern and new. It looks like an old motor at least. Um, And then I put a little jack shaft, which I think you're gonna see here in another picture or two. Here's the uh, Ashton counting index. And uh, Frank Dorian just copied this, and, um, prettied it up a little bit from what this one is, but um, it is an absolutely fantastic thing. When you release the handle, you return this up to the top. When you squeeze the handle, the detent in the back releases you pull the handle down, when you squeeze it, this one engages, the one in the back disengages, you pull it down, you release it. When you want to ratchet again, you push it up to the top. You can, you can index very, very, very fast. And you'll see this box later that we did. And just hundreds and hundreds of indexes and it doesn't take very long at all. Now, a lot of the tooling that was with this originally, it was originally it was 650 pounds. The lathe was 650 pounds sterling. And the, 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 what I understand is the guy spent a couple hundred pounds more before the end of the year when he bought it, he bought a lot of stuff. And one of the things that was with it originally was supposed to be one of these spherical spiral slides. A lot of the tooling got lost from the lathe and a lot of it came back to, to, to the lathe because of uh, John Edwards. He, when he owned it, he uh, chanced upon a cache of tooling and lo and behold, in with it was a lot of the tooling for this. I believe he sourced this out separately though. It is a spherical spiral uh, slide rest. So this attaches to the, uh, to the, uh, 
headstock by way of the gear train used for the uh, spiral attachment. There's a question just come in there. All right. Uh, from John Goodman, he says, does David have any plans to make videos of the equipment being used? We have plans to make videos of the equipment being used. We, we made a video today of one piece of equipment. If you go on our YouTube channel, you'll see six or eight videos there already. We also plan to do instructional videos. It'll be available for members. Mm -hmm. So we, we're working on a lot of that stuff, patching it together piece by piece. So in time, we'll have quite a few videos, I think. Um, we got to figure out how to use all this stuff before we can take too many videos of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> so on this machine, by the way, there's a front and back spiral attachment. This is a slide, slide rest um, that came with, to us with it. And I believe John sourced this out as well. The original slide rest was supposedly gunmetal. The guy ordered the entire thing in gunmetal. I don't know why, I don't understand it, but that he did. And with it is a, um, an auto drive with a stop system, um, a counting ratchet, stops, um, tool holder, magnifying glass, everything nicely fitted in the back here, you'll see this in a minute, a gear train. Here's the counting ratchet. If you want to go the other direction, you just flip these two things over. You flip that one over that way and that over there. This clever spring down here has detents in the middle so you could uh, freewheel it and comes down on that each side of that and holds it in place. This you, you move and you set to, uh, to limit how far you go so you can ratchet the same amount every time. This is that uh, auto feed. And uh, the kick out is here. You can kick out left or right. This goes at an angle and there's a little pin there. So if you go this way, it clicks it this way. If you go that way, it clicks it that way. Very clever. Um, and we, we put a separate overhead drive on to run this most of the time. One of the silly things I find here is if this is mounted here, you cannot mount the curvilinear slide, which is where I want the auto feed the most. But We'll have to uh, make a different arrangement to do that, I believe. Um, now, we'll go back here a couple, couple pages. Some of the things we've had to do, like this worm here, that worm was completely worn out. So somebody used that, that apparatus a lot. And my, my son, one of his jobs was to reproduce that worm. It's a three start worm. So um, what he did was he used the, the jaws of a three jaw chuck to uh, reset himself. We put a little clamp on it and move that way. And it turned out to be a standard thread pitch. Now this is the uh, elliptical cutting frame. And you see this gear here is not on most of them. That gear interfaces with this. And effectively, you can use your elliptical or your epicycloidal cutting frame to turn your geometric chuck, which we don't have for this lathe, but you can turn your geometric chuck into a two-stage geometric chuck because you can time it with the headstock. So it's, you, you can completely time that out to the headstock. It's, it's, uh, I haven't come up with anything in my head that, that needs that at the yet, but I am certainly going to try. This is the inspection mirror and magnifying glass came with the slide rest. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. I, I'm not, I, I haven't quite figured out what I would use it for except for seeing the bottom side of something, but I'm sure I'll figure it out when the day comes. This is uh, the pumping apparatus, which is incomplete at this point. We have, we have this that mounts to the, uh, headstock and we have this we have a big spring and some other parts but it's it's not complete we're going to have to figure that out this is a rose engine attachment for it and john said he doesn't quite understand how it works 
I'll eventually work on figuring that out. This is a geometric slide rest, and I think they might work together somehow. I am not quite sure. This, this goes in a toolbox, it's 9 16 and I think you can put a gear or a rosette on there, either one. And my guess is that you're supposed to uh, put a live tool on the front, put it in the toolbox, and that'll force this to go forth and back. But uh, again, that's something we got to work on. If anybody has any clue on that kind of thing, I would appreciate it. So far, I found nothing that this interface is with to mount it, but there's definitely a touch on the end of that. And uh, I think this must go on the, in the um, universal apparatus for the, uh, for the um, spherical, well, not spherical, but the uh, curve, um, spiral attachment, sorry. So this, this is, uh, um, this goes in the bed. And originally this lathe came with a bud rose chuck, which we don't have, but this would allow you then to put the uh, um, elliptical chuck onto, onto it. And then you could actually um, rock like with this chuck right here, you'll see the, the, there's, a, there's a little divot for, uh, for the elliptical chuck to go, to go through there. But that's why that was with this lathe. It's quite a rare piece. You can see a picture of that in, in the setup in John's, John Edwards' volume six of uh, Holtzapfel. This is a grinding slide that came with the lathe. There's an um, Arkansas stone in it at the moment. It is a beautiful thing. Um, we may have better ways to do that at this point, but it's a beautiful thing. Here's a set of drills that came with the lathe. And the set of drills was, um, they, they are, they're in the Cosmoline. They still have the Cosmoline on them. Whether someone put that there later or not, I don't know, but I can't find evidence that any of these drills were used. They're absolutely mint condition and they will stay that way as long as I have anything to say about it. Uh, these are patterns made, made up by a guy named Gadam. And he was, he was one of the, I think he was the second or third owner of the lathe. And he made up oh, 160 patterns or something like that. Trains going by. Made about 160 patterns and notated how all of them were made. Used all of his different apparatuses to do it. And he made those notes in shorthand, which none of us can read. But he does have instructions for all of them. He put them all in a book like this, or he had them all printed up and they're in envelopes. Um, and the intention was to publish them, I believe. But they're literally stacks and stacks of these printed up pieces. And they all correspond to the pieces in the boxes. They're all numbered and notated, etc. He must have put a couple years into that because it's crazy. Here's a video. If you want to see a video of the thing in operation, this is one of the first videos we took here. And it's vertical, it should be horizontal, and it was from a cell phone, but we'll take a look at it. My son set this up. And my wife edited it. As much as anything, we needed uh, evidence that things actually do get dirty here. And here's a picture of the, what he produced in the bottom of a box. Very nice. 
This is a bowl I made on the lathe using the elliptical chuck. Um, one thing that came with this lathe that was quite nice are two sets of risers. Uh, one set you need for the uh, spherical spiral slide. And the, I think the other set was just so you could raise everything up. So I had to raise it up to get this piece of burl in. I'm hoping to do some bigger ones by using two different lathes and sliding the headstock of one down to the other end and so forth. That was a, that was a nice, it's red mallee, which is a type of eucalyptus. And it was a gift from a member of the piece of wood. So is that from Australia, David? It is, yes. Next lathe in the, in the row is number 2157. And um, 2157 has quite a story. Uh, it doesn't have anything that really stands out per se as extraordinary, but it has a lot of stuff and it's all in the cabinet. It's, it's all in good order. Well, it has a front spiral, reciprocator, all that kind of thing. It has an elliptical cutting frame. Um, and then the normal chucks, rectilinear, elliptical, um, eccentric, and spherical chuck. Has a, a little power feed on the, on the slide rest. This, this lathe was made in 1864. And one of the, one of the neatest things about this one was uh, a, a guy wrote two, two letters to the SOT journal um, telling about one was telling about when he was a kid, he used to treadle this lathe for his father and about, his father got in about 1909. And he'd spend hours treadling the lathe and his father's friend, Lord Kelvin would come over and he would treadle for the two of them. And the other, the other thing was when, he, when his father died, it was 1941 and he, he had a machine shop and his foreman came to him and said, we can't make this part. And he described it as a swirler for the breach of a torpedo. So, so he, he had just inherited this lathe. He brought it into work and he said he found a young lassie with a soft touch that made hundreds of parts to no detriment to the lathe. And uh, quite, a, quite an interesting story. It's a World War II vet. But um, John recently got me in touch with the son-in-law of that guy. He sounds like he was quite the character. Um, always wanting to put this, these lathes to a test. I set this operation up here. I was very dubious about it working actually, but believe it or not, it worked very well. I made a drill that would, um, that would create the reeds. And what we did is we set an elliptical chuck on there. We set it to its maximum, um, it's maximum offset. And then because the spherical, or the, the, the dome chuck, the spherical chuck, wouldn't go out far enough, we put the rectilinear chuck and the eccentric chuck on. <laughs> and what we did is we timed them out and uh, we did a drawing, did a drawing of the pen and paper of the oval or the, the uh, ellipse, if you would. Old South will call it an oval, so I call it an oval most of the time. But we did a drawing of that. And then what you do is you find where the contour of you, what you want to make matches that drawing. You figure out the angle, you can twist this to it. It's, it's actually quite a relatively simple thing. And eventually we'll get our instructions written for it. Just today I finished the inside of one of these boxes. You use the worm here to advance it. If you don't use the worm, uh, it'll get away from you pretty fast because there's a it's a really really top heavy but this box is about um, three inches in diameter across here and probably four and a half inches this way it's it's a big for a piece of black wood and uh, what we do there it is That's here beautiful. I just use a I roughed it out with a universal cutting frame but and I'm shocked at the finish we got. There's a picture of the cabinet open. The cabinet is, is original and uh, it is a single overhead. Um, I think I have a picture of that later. Here my son has the uh, reciprocator set up um, and we were doing patterns. We were making patterns and we were recording 
we're trying not just to give you the settings for those, but to give to bring you to an understanding of how you get how you got there, so you can make other things. And these videos are on YouTube too, if you want to see them. But we're going at about triple the speed, otherwise you get bored pretty quick. <laughs> this chuck, by the way, is a Sherline chuck, and it's it's called a pie jaw chuck. It's much like the Swiss chucks, but it's it has four jaws, and these jaws are what it's referred to as 12L14 steel. It's free machining lead loy. Um, very easy to machine, um, and the, a new set of jaws is, I think, eighty dollars, and the chuck is something like three hundred and fifty. It's it's not a lot of money for them, and they're nickel boron plated so that they uh, they perform well with the uh, with the twelve L fourteen on the top that gives it a lubricity. We're um, making charts on relationships between amplitude and down here on your slide rest movement and all that kind of stuff. I think this um, box came out quite nice though. And is, is that a tungsten carbide cutter in that cutting frame, David? It is, it's uh, the circle tool or Whittier tool um, inserts and they're boring bar inserts. So they have a, a lot more rake to them. Mm -hmm. It's one of the cutting frames we make. See if I can get this to advance. There you go. Um, we made, the, the, we, we used the spiral attachment to make this part of it. Of course, you saw that on the other lathe. But spiral attachment did that. Uh, there's a smaller version of this that we did, and I did not have to use the rectilinear chuck on the small ones. It's only when I went to the big ones. But these are a series of pill, pill bottles we've, we've made with silver liners. This we also made on that, this lathe with the uh, sphere, with this spiral attachment. So you posted a picture today, David, of some pill bottles with some uh, silver tops or liners that extend uh, with guilloche work on them? Uh, that's just a, a ring that I, I screwed the the, the top is made of three pieces that are screwed together. And um, yeah, we guillotined that on, on uh, the Holtz Apple Rose engine here. Uh, I missed something here. Oh, I guess it doesn't matter much. This overhead here, I completely redid this because the original was just absolutely hammered and I thought if we used it, it would disintegrate. And um, Again, we, we redid this. We, we just made this. We, we made no new holes in the, in the, in the uh, lathe and we were able to take the original parts, set them on the shelf. And there are ball races once again in there. I found it's, it's, it has performed exceptionally well for us. We're very happy with it. I had about 14 bad ideas before somebody came up with that one. I don't even remember who it was. Um, probably a group of us. Frank Dorian helps us out quite a lot. And I would say he's our voice of wisdom here. And uh, he was in on that. Um, 2195, um, made in 1865. This was uh, Bill's first lathe and it was um, Norman Tweedles. Um, and, and this lathe is very well equipped as well, has front and back spiral attachments, um, elliptical chucks, there's a lot of tooling. A lot of it isn't 2195, it's a kind of a mismatch of stuff, but uh, Norman Tweed will put it together. I guess he did a lot of turns, turning. All this is original here, the pulleys, this top frame again, we replaced it. We used the same size rod as went through originally. We had to turn this entire rod down about 10 thousandths. And then uh, the ends 
the ends were turned down to fit the bearings in the, in the bearing cup. And by the way, this brass piece goes all the way through and we took and put little rings there so you can't see the ball bearings. All you can see is the, the rod going into it. Because frankly, I didn't want to walk up to an 1864 machine and see ball bearings. It just doesn't seem right. Um, and so you can treadle any of these machines. Somebody was a little bit, uh, I think they'd been drinking when they stamped that. They got this one that crooked that way and that one crooked that way. But it's, nonetheless, it's beautiful. The finishes on the gears, uh, this, is, this is kind of the lathe we're gonna start people out on because they're all lacking their original finish. They still look very, very beautiful, but they're not that, they're not that deep lacquered and, and um, water of air stone finish. A question from Seth Kennedy, uh, David, he's saying, do you mark the new parts on those overheads as being made by you? No, not really, not really. I mean, it's obvious they're not old. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, it's not obvious when you walk in the room, but if you walk up to it. I did mark the ones we put on the shelf. They're all labeled, they have tags on them. If I get hit by a bus, you guys can figure out which one goes with what. <laughs> um, just another pic picture of uh, pictures of the details there. One thing unusual about this is it still retains its little oil reservoir. And of course, that's if you have an old South Bend lathe or something, they have this in the, in the tailstock, and almost always the dipper's gone out of the South Bend lathe. But this was for uh, oiling the dead centers. And uh, honestly, one of the worst condition old South of lathes I've ever seen still had this thing. And uh, there's a little strap on the bottom, beautifully made, but I just don't see those very often. And I, the strap is so fine, I can see why it got torn off. The toolbox is quite nice on this one too. This, this uh, the elliptical ring, the cam ring, this did not come with this lathe. I don't know what lathe it was from, but came, it came with the lathe to us, but it was not original to the lathe. It was over 20 thousandths off. It was a half a millimeter off center. So what, you know, no matter what direction you go, you're gonna get criticized. So I figured I'd go for the one that made sense to me. So what, what I had my son do is cut this right along there and separate the two pieces. Um, well, I don't know why it does that. Separate the two pieces. First, I had him drill through both of them before he cut them, and then, and then cut them, and then he was able to dial this piece in here and move it over so that it would accommodate the 20 thousandths. And this is now the most accurate cam ring in the place. Um, two of our lathes have the elliptical compensators on them. And what I did is I had my son make this unit here that goes to the spindle. I had him make that for uh, 2157 as well. So we can use that on three of our lathes now. We have the, the uh, elliptical compensator for three lathes. That's, that's a real nice piece to have. Not too many of them have it. Here it is again here. Here the toolbox is open. Uh, there's a wrench missing and so forth. But it's, it's fairly well full still. And, uh, that's, that's pleasing. Some of the patterns we were working on writing up instructions for. Here are some pieces that I just don't know what they are. I'm assuming this is some kind of slow speed drive, but I cannot figure out how it hooks up. I think that worm goes to this wheel. Uh, this must work off the overhead or something. And I, I'm not sure if any of you guys have any clue on that. I would be glad to hear about it, but uh, I'll continue to look. It came with, came with the lathe and as um, clever as Norman was, um, it has to have some good purpose. Right here is a spring detent, and this spins around, and you can you know, index to different positions that way. This is an unusual um, dead center, and this offsets, and then you can do tapers. So you can go and make a specific offset and do tapers. Um, a little 
set of ways there. Quite a nice piece. I think we're going to make a couple more of those eventually. Um, this one here was done on that Ashton indexer, these ones here. This here is a, is a, a reciprocator pattern my son did. And it takes um, three, three different settings and three different passes to, to get there. And these are part of those pill bottles we made. The, uh, drew, drew the uh, silver liner. We spun the rim over so it seats down in there. And there are two, um, about here and here, there are two O-rings that hold it in there so it won't fall out. And um, they can they can be removed. Here's a here's another picture of that reciprocator pattern. I thought it was pretty clever. I haven't quite seen anything like it, and it looks good. This was uh, indexed with that Ashton um, counting index too. Is that some pink ivory there? It is. It's pink ivory. Mm, it's, it's, it's a very nice one as well. I mean, it's, it, it does seem to vary uh, the pink ivory we get these days, but that's a, that's a really nice red color, that one. It's, this is some stuff I had laying around a long time. I can't find any new stuff quite as good as that. And, uh, I use that um, Tableau, Tableau tile polish on the newer stuff, and it helps quite a bit, but it's nothing like the old stuff I had. Um, more, more pictures of the same. And this is faux ivory, by the way. We're very pleased with this faux ivory. We get it out of a place in Connecticut. And, uh, the color is good. The, the grain in it's good. Here's another uh, pattern my son came up with. He calls it shark tooth. Again, it's two different settings and they interface with each other to create kind of, a, kind of an interesting effect. This finial in the top was done on a geometric chuck. And we'll see more of that later. Um, these these patterns were done on uh, on my rose engine. Did you see the side patterns? There's some more reciprocator work. Bill asked my son the other day if there were any of the things we made that he didn't like, and he said this one here. <laughs> he doesn't like this box. <laughs> I absolutely think it's fantastic. Very, very simple. Um, to, me, to me, often simple is more beautiful and it's a singular pass indexed around. And to me, it just jumps, jumps at you. And a good picture of the inside. And yes, I know we got our cutting frame just a little bit low, but you're also three inches deep in the box, so. This he calls turtle pattern, and it's the same thing as this last picture. It's the same thing as this, except you phase 180 degrees and cut on top of each other. He calls it the turtle pattern because it looks like the, the back of the turtle in the Mario Kart game, <laughs> Mario Brothers, which uh, most of you guys probably wouldn't, wouldn't uh, recognize. So is that normal speed, David? Is that speed it up? That's normal speed there. Normal speed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now this universal joint, the, the first machine I showed you, or the second machine I showed you, 2410, that was missing from 2410. And my son just knocked one of those off the other day too. Mm -hmm. He's getting good at that kind of stuff. Holt Saffel number 1636. Now, um, John Jacob Holt Saffel, in a letter, they, they got this lathe back and they were trying to sell it in a letter to uh, a customer. He said it was the, the finest example that they ever made. Of course, he was trying to sell the lathe. 
some would argue that number 16 is nicer. It very well could be, I don't know. But uh, this is one incredible lay. Um, one absolutely incredible lay. Uh, in the years since, we've had three different slow speed drive systems. One mounted here, one mounted here, and um, there was another one that mounted up here. Frank Dorian made this box in the back and the box goes all the way across the back. It, it mounts by, by gravity here. Are, the little piece of steel comes underneath the lathe so there's nothing invasive. Back here where this protrudes, he made the box so that it accepted that. It's absolutely beautiful. We put a couple steel pads in the front to level it out. And it has an electric clutch and a DC drive motor. So when you flip the DC drive motor on, the electric clutch engages and um, it, it takes off and releases very, very nicely. And this here, he did a turnbuckle to match the turnbuckle here fairly well. Very, very nice. Uh, up here, you'll also see our, our set of chisels that was made for the um, Crystal Palace exhibit, I guess in 1851, it was part of the Old Sample exhibit there. And um, those, uh, you, you just have to hold one in your hand to really appreciate it. It's, they're incredible. This lathe was made in 1838. Not only does it have the cabinet, but the drawers are full. Um, has a swash plate, maximum obliquity, 33 hundredths of an inch. This, I absolutely love that. And you twist this and this outer rosette will go oblique and you can, it has interchangeable row split rosettes is what they are. They're interchangeable in, in, in the course of about two or three minutes. Look at this spring here. Isn't that just magnificent? Bend in place so it won't fall out. But interestingly, when you put the touch in here, they actually made them crooked. This, that one was especially crooked. Um, which shocked me in a way. I, I didn't expect that from, from them. Um, this is the um, Ibbotson uh, first part geometric chuck um, and the tray of tools and the uh, catch for the uh, sun gear. It's interesting, this was, this was made before they used these in printing. Now, this is the straight line chuck and the fluting chuck or the pin chuck. Interestingly, you can take the front of this off and mount it on the, on the spindle. It's the only worm drive on the machine. So you can use it to uh, phase or align or all that as well as it being the uh, straight line chuck. Here is the chain drive. And uh, John, John Edwards gave me severe warnings about using a chain drive because he says it, it essentially warps the image. I couldn't figure out what he's talking about because I've, I've used them. But this one here will warp the image ever so slightly because it only attaches here and then it attaches to itself down here. Whereas on, on like an American Kenlock machine, it attaches here and it attaches to the bottom piece down here. In that case, it won't deviate. But nonetheless, I have used these. You can get good results out of them. But if you're gonna build one, I think I'd build a rack and pinion or set that chain so it attaches. The thing with a rack and pinion is you're probably gonna get another half inch, three quarters of an inch of travel. But this mounts in the lathe through the three holes and then has three studs that, that put it, keep it in place. This is the um, rocking tail stock. It mounts here. Um, in the three holes here, one, two, three, and these three holes here, one, two, and three, those, those are what mounts straight line chuck. This mounts through the hole here, and then this is your normal tailstock for rocking. This tailstock has a spring in, and that, that moves in and out for pumping, and this is your slender turning steady rest. It's it maybe overkill, but we're nothing if we're not overkill in this stuff. And this is the most beautiful spanner wrench I've ever seen. It's a box, uh, box joint wrench. 
absolutely magnificent spanner wrench. Quick question there from uh, Dan uh, Schlotten. Oh, crikey, how do we pronounce this, Dan? Dan Schlonnick. Uh, sorry for the novice question, but what does that chain drive do? Uh, okay, what happens is this goes in between these two parts and this screws to the spindle. There's a screw that goes through and attaches it to the spindle. And when you turn the spindle, it pulls that chain. I don't know why it keeps jumping on me. It pulls the chain up and down and in turn makes this part go up and down because right there, that bolts to this. So that's what turns your rotary motion here into linear motion here. I guess that answers it. And apologies, Dan, if I pronounce your name wrong. Um, so these are temp and chucks and a paper chuck. The temp and chuck is so called because it stretches the, this ring stretches the paper over the top. This is leather back here. Um, stretches it over the top like a drum or a timpani. These three are all fitted to the drawers, the original. I don't know that this is original to the kit, but it is made like Holtz Apple would have made stuff. It is absolutely beautiful. What happens is uh, this catches right here, so that it can't tip forward anymore. So you can put pressure on it, tips it back. You got a spring right here. Um, the spring um, gives, it, gives it enough pressure to write. When you back off, this limits where it backs off, and that also limits where it backs off. So it's just absolutely beautiful. I had to show a picture of that. There's the engraving on the top of the head, uh, the slide rest. Um, the stamp in the, in the bed was uh, Walter G. Hines. He was the owner of this thing. And Walter Hines bought this, I believe in 1932. Uh, the previous owner had advertised it in 1929. Nobody bought it. When he died, the widow advertised it again. Walter Hines was 18 years old. He worked at the bank. He was, not a, he was not from a rich family. He just had a regular jo bank job. And he, um, he couldn't sleep at night or something. He had four whole Safalais already, but when he saw this advertised, he went to see the widow. I guess he went repeatedly to see the widow. She finally sold it to him. He was, again, 18 years old, and he had four whole Safalais already. Uh, he retained the lathe for 21 years. And he sold it to Warren Ogden to pay for three years of his son's engineering school. So he, he, was, <laughs> he was brought to the sales point by college. Uh, I don't use this slide rest much, although you can loosen here and loosen here and it rotates. You can, so you can spin this in a rotational manner. Um, but I don't use it much. It, it would be a very difficult thing to renew if you if you wore out the gibbs and the slides it's also not particularly robust so it's not that i won't use it but we have slides that actually function a little better and uh for preservation's sake i think i think this one's just as well in the in the cabinet for most of the time these are patterns my son made with the uh, geometric chuck and, uh, it's black wood with uh this is uh Madrone burl, and this is myrtle burl. These are the lids he made on the eccentric chuck with, uh, with the, um, the you know, 1636 Rose engine. He took the um, patterns in Holt Sapple. He used and this one here, he used a universal cutter and then he went to a ball on these other two. He thought the ball gave him a little more detail and turned them into three dimensional, um, which I have not seen anybody quite do like that yet. This was pumped on my little Rose engine, which I brought one of those down here. Here's some more of those boxes, geometric pattern here. Pictures, all, all these pictures are Becky's. Geometric chuck for these lids for I believe he did six. Um, uh, 
there's another geometric chuck pattern. This is my machine. I brought one of them down to use here and I decorated this box with that machine all across the board. It's a very um, user-friendly and effective machine. Um, the bottoms were done on my machine as well, so the sides. This is the made lathe slide rest. We don't have the made lathe here yet. I think we're gonna have to talk to the manufacturers and give them a chewing out. But we have the slide rest and we use, we use this on 1636 as well as um, one of the other lathes if we use the risers with it. But um, this is uh, more a modern version of, of the old ornamental slide rest. We have ball bearings in both ends, this end and this end. You can take up the, uh, you can preload the bearings there. Um, we have stops here. Um, we have interchangeable touches so that you can match the touch size to your cutting frame. And the weight system so you don't have to pull the, hold the lever. You know, the weight goes across, pulls the liar in. And the liar shape was Mike Stacy's idea. Looks quite nice. A little engraving for your elevator. You can tell how much you're going up and down. Um, adjustable, um, adjustable uh, um, indicator on there. We have stops. This, this is the uh, stop for uh, the auto stop. You can auto stop in either direction and that repeats within about two thousandths of an inch. These are our cabinet making machines and eventually we'll have a, a like a journeyman cabinet maker here and um, basically giving them a leg up. A young person has a lot of drive at the top, top of the food chain and uh, give them a place they can come and work for a couple of years and get themselves established and have a, a network of people around them to, to, to carry them through life. This is a 16 inch bandsaw. We use this for metal as well as wood. We have a variable frequency drive that slows it down. This is pronounced Boyerle. Boyerle is in a German company. It's a 28 inch planer. Um, you can do nice big wide boards that planer is as smooth as anything I've ever used. Uh, obviously a bridge port. I bought it from a, one of my vendors who bought it new in the 1990s. It was, got a CNC machine shortly after and hardly used the thing. Uh, this is a 36 inch bandsaw. Um, you can do 22 inch resawing here. If you take the guard off, we, we managed to do 17 inches on a board not too long ago. And it sailed through like butter and a hot knife. It, just is really something else. This, this is a machine I pulled out of my barn and brought down because it's a small lathe, came out of a school in Philadelphia. And uh, it's not so intimidating as our other one. It's just a nice little lathe and I uh, figured this was a better place for it than home, but it is not restored like these other ones. This is, a, I believe a 22 inch joiner. It, um, it's from the 1920s, but we put a new helical carbide helical head in it. And it is, uh, it hardly changes noise when you run a board through it. It's so smooth. Uh, Martin table saw, it's a German table saw. This, this is a sliding, sliding side cast iron base. It was the last model they made with cast iron base. Um, you see, it's a big room with a lot of room between machines. It's just very spacious. You can put your, uh, fence on here and swing it down out of the way. Uh, let's see. The next is a mortiser. It's an Oliver mortiser. It came off of the ship USS Vulcan in World War II. Uh, it was a repair ship and it was another World War II vet. Unipoint radial arm saw. It's the, uh, the best of the radial arm saws. They still make this today. This is a dust maker though. Um, this is a Oliver pattern maker's lathe. It was bought in 1946, used in a pattern shop, and then it went to a piano shop in Detroit and was used there until not too long ago. It was bought, taken to, uh, 
take it down and rebuild. And Hardin's HLVH, um, that, that was rebuilt by Babin Machine Tool. I uh, put it to the test when we first got it and ran a six inch piece, made a cut all the way down a six inch piece and I don't have an instrument fine enough to measure the run out and uh, I can measure down to a tenth of a thousandth. It is a pleasure to operate. It's absolutely incredible. It's the EM version, which means English and metric, which means these now the, these dials have counters in them. So this dial turns at a different pace than this dial. This is metric, this is standard, and you slide this forward and back, depending on which one you want to read. Um, the big thing is we can thread metric, which comes in handy with the strange sizes you run into with Holt sample. And um, we have a digital readout so the, the, the knobs and handles aren't that important, but it's still interesting. Old Saffle table saw, from what I can figure out, this is an extremely early table saw. I've never seen another dual system like this with the lap on one side, table saw on the other, and then you can take the table saw out and put a grinding wheel in here. It's a wet grinding thing. This was a gift from a member. Um, and here's a video of this running. Probably choppy on your screen, but nonetheless, um, we had to come in at night and get a video in the darkness because it's, it is, you stand and watch it for a while before you actually set up and start taking pictures. So that's the end of the slideshow. Um, I'll go back then to, uh, to my screen and uh, there you go. Okay. So if there are any questions, I'd be glad to take questions. Okay, now then, um, if anyone would like to ask a question, um, can you use the raise hand facility on the bottom menu bar on uh, most of the computers, um, this, the reactions label there, click on that and you'll see a sign for raise hand. So Re Ruby Claire, I see, has raised her hand. Um, can you unmute yourself, Ruby, and ask your question? I'm not sure whether... Uh, <clears throat> Hopefully I've got everybody set up for, uh, uh, let me have a look. Uh, yeah, you should be able to unmute yourself now, Ruby. Try that. Yeah. Okay, finally I can un unmute. <laughs> uh, David, you mentioned that uh, you were having classes there. How long are the classes in duration and a rough idea of cost? Um. Well, we haven't had classes yet. We've had a couple of individuals out and um, I, I suppose cost is gonna depend on what, what it is we're doing and how long will depend on um, what we're trying to teach. But, but um, we kind of envision people, what we'll offer classes at, uh, from periods of time, probably over a weekend and then we'll offer individual instruction, probably um, customized to what the person wants. So it's, you know. I think it's great. Yeah, 